Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for our virtual hour tonight with Susan Sloan, um, author of A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy, and Lessons for the World. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christina Dmitrievsky, and I am the global co-chair of Generation M, uh, the United Macedonian Diaspora's Young Leaders Program. Um, so just a little bit about UMD before we begin. Um, UMD is an international non-governmental organization uh, that promotes the interests and needs of Macedonian communities around the world, including an estimated half a million Mas um, Americans of Macedonian heritage. Um, the organization sponsors educational, cultural, and linguistic programming, um, provides scholarships, holds youth leadership conferences, organizes an annual birthright trip to Macedonia, gives aid to children with disabilities in Macedonia, and leads disaster relief efforts in times of need. Um, so just briefly um, about how Susan and I met just before we get started. Um, Susan and I met through UMD President Metokoloski just over a year and a half ago um, over breakfast in Washington, D.C. Um, and I learned um, about her work at AJC as well as their Young Leaders Program, Access. Um, AJ AJC's Access um, Program has been such a wonderful inspiration um, for Generation M and the work that we've done, um, which just makes this virtual hour that much more special to host. Um, so as mentioned, Susan works for a global advocacy organization, engaging with diplomats, um, government officials, community organizers, and international leaders. Um, she has met with more than 60 countries through diplomacy, advocacy, and experiential education. Um, at the age of 30, she completed a life goal of visiting all seven continents amazing. Um, and Susan holds a master's degree in global strategic communications from Georgetown University um, and graduated magna cum laude uh, with a bachelor's degree in journalism uh, with a major in public relations and a minor in Spanish from the University of Georgia. So um, just uh, briefly, I'd like to turn it over to UMD President Mito Koloski to say a few words about Susan. Thank you, Christina, so much. And I'm really, really excited about tonight's event, particularly because I've known uh, Susan probably for about six years now. I met her uh, through the American Jewish Committee. Uh, there was a, an event at their, their office, and they always have these amazing uh, inner community, inner uh, ethnic, inner religious group dialogue uh, discussions. And I really appreciate Susan bringing UMD to the table. Um, and, and so, how how timely with her book being called A Seat at the Table. And so UMD having a seat at the table uh, at these events in Washington means a lot. And together with Susan, we've done uh, numerous Macedonian Jewish events. Uh, some of the highlights are, you know, this kind of a, a Macedonian culinary night with uh, one chef, Kirill, who actually happens to be the chef at the Marriott in Skopje right now, but he hosted uh, a dinner for about 35 or so Macedonian Macedonian and Jewish young uh, American leaders here in town. We've done joint events with our interns, uh, and so Macedonians and, and, and Jewish Americans meeting. Um, and then also, um, you know, these embassy events and discussions. And so I'm, it's, it's really an honor to have worked with Susan all these years. And, you know, just about the book and, and and something about Susan. One, you know, she's a, an amazing host, extremely welcoming. Uh, I, I like to call her a relationship broker as well. Um, and and I recently completed reading reading her book, and I wrote her an Amazon review, and and I said that this book is mandatory reading for all diplomats, political scientists, foreign policy wonks, and those pursuing a career in diplomacy international politics, foreign policy, cultural anthropology, and more. And in my opinion, the U.S. Department of State and foreign ministries around the world should have it as required reading for all incoming civil and career foreign service officers. Gender uh, parity should not be, should, uh, should not be more critical 
could not be more critical uh, today, especially for those on the negotiations table. I've purchased the book actually as a gift for several friends already. So thank you very much, Susan, for conducting all these thought-provoking interviews with U.S. and foreign diplomats in Washington and abroad. You truly opened my eyes to a whole new world. The book is engaging, emotional, insightful, very educational, and funny at times. I thoroughly enjoyed it and can't wait to hear your talk tonight. Thank you, Meto. It's a pleasure to be with you all and to be here with friends and colleagues. And even though we're Zooming in from different places, I'm glad we can make it possible. Oh, am I muted? Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Susan, um, for joining us this evening. Um, we're so excited to have you as a speaker for tonight's virtual conversation. Um, you know, you've been such a great friend of mine, METOS and UMDs. Um, so we're, we're very excited for, for tonight. Um, and I guess just a, just a friendly reminder for our audience. Um, so feel free to comment your questions uh, in the Zoom chat or in the comments section if you're watching um, on Facebook. Um, and I guess with that, we'll, we'll begin. I have so many questions and uh, I may need to cut it down as we go, uh, depending on time. So, I mean, uh, I guess just, just to start off, um, Susan, I, I remember seeing you at uh, the Advisory Council on Bosnia and Herzegovina's uh, gala in Washington, D.C. Um, I believe it was in April of 2019. Um, in the prologue of your book, you outline how this was an inspiration behind your work. Um, given your career and, and background, can you tell us how somebody who works at a global advocacy organization like AJC um, decides to write a book on such an important topic and, and what inspired you to be so passionate about it? Going back to that night, Christina, I know a bunch of us were, were there in our black tie attire and if you remember, all of the people that were honored that evening happened to be all women. And I don't know about you and everyone else on the call. However, in Washington, D.C., rarely do you see all women leaders being honored at an event. So for me, it was very personal in a different way that I had never been to an event like that before. And what I discovered is that these stories were so powerful of women ambassadors government officials and for-profit uh, women who work in a different sector, that I, I didn't want their stories to happen in a vacuum. Uh, we've seen significant cultural change within our society with the Me Too movement. I wanted to share stories, not as women being victims, but rather of successful women being trailblazers and leaders. And so that was the goal of the book. And it all started actually that evening. It was really the impetus of the book in a different way because I didn't want these stories to happen in a vacuum. And as I received the opportunity to write a book, uh, what better topic than women in diplomacy? And I've worked in diplomacy for an NGO since 2014. And hearing women's voices at the table is something that really hits home for me and other women, especially given that many of us have been the only woman at a table. So that was part of the idea, but that gala really spurred uh, the, the whole book. And I ended up interviewing more than 30 women leaders from around the globe, from different countries. And that really made the, the whole book in addition to some research and data that backs up their stories. Oh, wow. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, I, I do remember being there that, that evening. And um, I, I remember, you know, I, I did tear up at a couple of those stories. It was just so inspiring, just, you know, being in a room um, among so many fantastic and, and inspirational women. So I definitely, um, I, I definitely understand where you're coming from with all of that. Um, now, I, I guess we can move on to my next question. Um, I, I wanted to learn a little bit more um, about how you decided to structure the book. So um, there are four parts um, and they focus on diplomacy, power, stability, and balance. Um, how did you choose these topics? 
It all started with the interviews, actually. I didn't start writing the chapters or even the table of contents until halfway through the book writing process, which seems backwards. However, uh, the process was quite different than other book writers. So what I did is I went on a journey to interview women from around the world, and I'll, I'll tell you the, the countries I, I got to spend time with. So Afghanistan, Albania, Australia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Denmark, Finland, France, Hungary, Iceland, Kosovo, Kurdistan, Macedonia, Mexico, Namibia, Singapore, Sweden, and the U.S. And so all of these women through these conversations started building the book in a different way. I asked all the leaders these same five questions, which I will not tell you which questions that I asked, but I asked them the same five questions. And then from their stories, themes started to emerge. And the book got broken down in these four parts from their stories. And as I wrote the stories, that's when I realized, okay, the chapter structure is going to look like this. The book is going to look like that. However, in the middle of writing the first draft manuscript, and I have not shared this publicly yet, so only for exclusively for UMD, uh, I actually only had three parts to the book. Oh, wow. And as my editor was looking over the manuscript, the editor told me, these chapters are way too long. You have to split them up. And so a week before I was turning in my manuscript, I made the fourth part to the book and split up chapters. So it ended up being structured quite differently than I originally even planned. Uh, but that happens in the writing process. And I'm sure as many of you, when you work on different projects, when you're in the middle of something, you end up changing it. And that's the way writing is. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I have the book right in front of me and I, I, started, I started reading it a, a couple of weeks ago and I just remember just flipping to the, the table of contents. I don't know if anyone can see, but I saw how nicely it was split up and I was like, wow. Should I start at the beginning or should I just start at the part where I'm like super interested and I would love to, you know, I guess, see if I can, if I can, you know, get some guidance from the book, you know, an area that I'm currently struggling with. So, How did you end up reading it? Did you end up uh, reading it as written or did you jump around? I'm curious. I've been jumping around. There, like, I, I don't believe I've actually gotten to the part, um, the stability part. I have not gotten there yet. Um, I read, yes, so it was just the stability part that I actually have not gotten to yet. Um, I started reading from part four. <laughs> so, um, yes, no, um, it's, it's been fantastic to read. I've learned so much so far. It's such an easy read, but it's, it's very informative. And, um, you know, thank you so much for writing this because I, for one, um, definitely uh, needed some of the lessons that I've been reading about in this book. So... Um, I, I guess that kind of leads into my next question. Um, how did you choose your interviewees? I wanted to hit all regions of the world uh, as much as possible. And I really wanted these diversity of leaders and to hear their perspective coming from different angles. And also their, when I looked at the span of someone's career, uh, I try to get a full span of diplomacy. So you'll see in the book that there's a few women who are early in their career, and there's mid-level career professionals, and then there's the upper tier of the women who have reached the highest peaks of diplomacy, whether they're an ambassador or a foreign minister. Uh, but understanding that where people come from uh, shapes their views. And I know tonight we have many people on the call, and I'm curious if you guys can throw in the chat box where you're zooming in from or where you're from, that would really help us. So put in the chat box, we'd love to see where you guys are from and uh, that would be awesome, I, I'd love to know. If you can see the chat box, fill it out. Nice, Atlanta, it's great. Hey Lauren from Atlanta. Anyone else? California, fantastic. Toronto, Canada, love it. Sydney, Australia. We'll have to tell our Australia story later, yeah. DC, wonderful. Our hometown where most of us are living. Good old Maryland, I love it. Christina, do you, should we go to the next question? Absolutely, sorry, I was having some issues there on meeting myself. 
Um, yeah. So, I mean, another thing that I noticed while, while reading A Seat at the Table, um, I noticed that you chose to use the term gender parity um, as opposed to gender equality or gender equity, um, which are, I guess, terms that we've been hearing a lot more frequently. Um, can you expand a little bit more on your definition of gender parity? So I use parity, equality, and equity throughout the book, and they actually mean different things. So when you hear the term gender parity, it's really the measurement of the balance of gender in a situation. So for instance, who's sitting around the table? Is there gender parity? So is there 50% women and 50% men? That's what gender parity is, simply a measure. When we speak about gender equality, that's different. It's more so about equal representation and it's typically tied to the rights and policy changes. So that's gender equality. So that's different than parity. And lastly, we have gender equity. And that's this idea that it's a fairness of the treatment between men and women based on what they need. So what a man needs in the workplace may be different than what a woman needs in the workplace. So equity is quite different. And equity also has to deal with these rights and benefits and obligations and opportunities. And so each of those three terms, parity, equality, and equity are quite different. However, many people use them uh, within each other and, and don't under really understand the difference between the three. However, there is a difference. And I use gender parity throughout the book because I believe having both men and women around the table is going to create better solutions for our countries and for our world. And simply having that diversity will help fulfilled. And now we're in a different time where diversity is seen in multiple lenses. And I know we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but it first starts with gender, right? To get both men and women at the table. Uh, and then the other layers of diversity come to play, whether it be socioeconomic status, race, culture, religion, ethnic origin, sexual orientation. So all that plays into the lens and who's around the table. Excellent. Um, and I guess besides having, you know, greater equality, um, what do you think the importance of having more women at, you know, with a seat at the table is? Um, I know you touched on that just now briefly. So to have more women at the table and, and why it's important, uh, there's, a, there's a few reasons why it's important. Uh, generally speaking, yes, we should have gender equality 100%. But also research is showing that having women at the table benefits everyone equally. And what I mean by that is that there's a statistic that came out saying that the participation of civil society groups, including women's organizations, it makes a peace agreement 64% less likely to fail. In addition to that, foreign policy research recently stated that companies with the highest percentage of women in management are 47% more profitable than the lowest. So it hits that bottom line of more profitability to have women in leadership positions and management positions. However, uh, we've seen that many women aren't in these leadership positions. And so last year's in 2019 Fortune 500 list of women CEOs, there were only 33 women on there. That's 6.6%, .6%, so that's not gender parity. And so if we understand that having women at the table is more profitable, creates better solutions, then why aren't we having there? Why aren't we having them there? So it's not only important from those statistical points, there's also this level of how women relate. And I'll tell you a story uh, about uh, the ambassador from Finland who I interviewed. And in the book, I write that when she spoke with me, she told me that women have this inherent ability to listen. And she's seen many of her colleagues in diplomacy gather people around the table and they take themselves out of this ego-driven leader and they are more of a convener having people listen. And women tend to be the listener. And there's something very special about that in multitude of ways because if you have a leader who is willing to listen, then you're going to have a leader who will hear multiple solutions. That can be very powerful. 
So listening is one key factor. In addition to that, having more women at, this, at the decision-making table can affect security and peace. When women, and it's been shown and proven, and I talk about these stories in the research in my book, that women who are in conflict zones are able to go into the community in a far different way than men. They're able, especially in socially conservative countries, they're able to go into the homes of families and speak to the women. A man cannot go ahead and do that. And what they learn from speaking to the women is if it's safe for the children to go to school. So that means, are the streets safe? They understand the cultural and social and political context based on what the women are telling them of the safety and security of the family. If women security leaders are not able to meet with other women, we won't have that information. And so that directly affects peace and security in multiple conflict areas. And so having women who are getting and gathering this information, bringing it to the table, they're able to open up the lens of how we look at global solutions. In addition to that, I'd say that from the conversations of these women leaders that I had, women see things differently than men inherently. And we need both men and women at the table to come up with these plans that help our countries and our companies and our organizations. And when you lack that diversity lens of gender, you're missing out on 50% of the population. That's a large percentage. Yeah. No, I, I, I completely understand. And I believe you had another story in here about, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it was the same ambassador um, that was um, in Yemen uh, with the 16-year-old girl. Um, it was just such an interesting story um, to, to read because I find that, you know, and, you know, you, you just kind of explained it, I'm sure better than I'll be able to explain it, but um, women just have this different touch. Um, you know, we're, we, we know how to relate, um, you know, not that men cannot, um, it's just in a different way. Um, so I, I definitely, um, I definitely agree with all of that. And, um, I guess, you know, this kind of leads into my next question. Um, what advice do you have for young women that are aspiring to break into, into, um, diplomacy or any other male dominated field? This question I think is so important uh, for women, but also how we uh, train women to go into not only diplomacy, but yes, male dominated fields, which there are many of. Uh, number one, and this is what I heard from so many of the women I interviewed is education, educating yourself, whether you get an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, a PhD, all of the women I interviewed who are very uh, prominent leaders, all had significant education. It was a factor that they all shared uh, no matter where they came from. So number one, education. Number two, they started saying yes to themselves at a very early age. And what I mean by that is that oftentimes in a woman's career, especially in a male dominated field, women are told no, or that they can't do something. And so taking that away, and you mentioned uh, Ambassador Barbara Bodine, who is the US ambassador to Yemen. Um, she took that idea that hearing no all the time, she was just going to turn it into a yes. And that's this idea of saying yes to yourself and being inclusive of yourself. And we needed to train our young women to do that. In addition to that, uh, a few ambassadors told me that women who are looking to get any job or anything they want to do, they have to change their own mindset. So one of the factors is, uh, and the Swedish ambassador said this to me in our conversation, I write about it in the book, that uh, a man will look at a job and the qualifications and see 10 qualifications. And he'll say, oh, wow, I fit two of those. You know, this job is for me. And a woman will look at the same job and will have eight of the 10 qualifications. And she'll say, oh, you know, I don't have all 10. I, I don't think I should apply. And so as women, we have to say yes to ourselves. We cannot say the no, be the first person to say no. And so those two things of saying yes and getting an education can really propel people in this field. More than that, many of the women I interviewed all had a significant colleague or mentor that gave them positive reinforcement along the way. And so whether you're entering this field or if you are in deep into your career, whether it be a mid-level career professional or at the top of your career, you have the power 
to mentor and guide both men and women, and that will give them more seats at the table. Thank you. Um, and I, I guess to kind of switch gears a little bit, um, I wanted to touch on something. Um, so in, in Macedonian, we have a word, um, it's, it's domakinka. Um, and a loose definition of this is a woman that can do it all, but primarily in the home. Um, how do we break out of these cultural norms that sometimes restrict women's growth within the community? I love that term. Uh, and there's a similar term that we have in Judaism that uh, we talk about during our Sabbath, which is called Eshes Kail, which is a, a woman of valor. It's in the Old Testament uh, in the Bible. Uh, and so I know many cultures and societies know this term of uh, a woman can do it all. And there are many cultural norms, yes, that restrict women's growth within their community uh, in multiple ways. And whether they come from a socially conservative country or not. Uh, and what I found is that women have to be creative. And more than that, governments have not only an obligation, but an opportunity to create policies that have more women at the table. So I, I wanna tell you a story actually about one woman I interviewed who, who works for, uh, I'll call it a public diplomacy firm, and she shared with me that when she was working for the US administration under the Clinton administration, and she was traveling quite a bit for her work, she had her first child and her child was below the age of five and she was abroad and she missed her child very, very much. And one of her contacts happened to be the, the Latvian president, uh, Vera Victor Freiberger. And she could see that this woman uh, was uncomfortable that she had to leave her son all the time. And so uh, Latvian president said to her, I know it's so hard and you want to do it all. And sometimes you're not able to do that. And so she said, listen, you can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. You've got to be creative and figure out how you're going to do this with your son. And so what she decided to do was reach out to all the different embassies she was visiting at the time in different countries. She brought her son with her, created play dates for him during the day, and then saw him in the evening. And while that's not ideal, uh, it was a way for her to see her son and to bring him abroad. And he's traveled all over the world with her, and he's met more probably leaders before the age of six than any other uh, human <laughs> probably during that time. So being creative and taking away this cultural norm that you can't bring your children with you is, is, one, is one story. Another story though uh, that I'll share with you is that as men and women are socially changing in our society of what we deem culturally appropriate, we have an ability to make this shift right now. And many of the women I spoke to their cultural norms were quite different based on the countries that they were from. In the Scandinavian Nordic countries that I interviewed different ambassadors, uh, they felt they had already reached this idea of gender parity and equality and that they still have ways to go, but they, they felt that their society and their government, the policies reflected that and that they didn't see much difference necessarily between men and women versus from other countries, even women who are representing the United States felt that our cultural norms still hold women back and restrict their growth. So culturally, it depends on which country people are coming from and how the policies within a government can really change where they're seen, where, how they're seen in society. And, you know, I, I guess kind of going off that, um, we can also touch on um, Macedonia's first ambassador to the U.S., um, Ljubica Achevska. Um, I, you interviewed her in your, for, your, for your book, and I, I just wanted to, you know, get, get your thoughts because first, you know, female or first ambassador to the U.S., um, female, born in Macedonia. I wanted to know your thoughts. I wanted to, you know, just kind of pick your brain a little bit and, and just you know, think about or understand a little bit more about what was running through your mind while you were interviewing her. Well, I really have to call out Meto for <laughs> making the introduction because I wouldn't have interviewed her had it not been for Meto introducing me to her. 
And there are many male allies that I've had and colleagues that have introduced me to amazing women for this book. So shout out to all the men who have been so helpful on this journey. So it really takes both of us, men and women, to create gender equality and gender parity. That's number one. Uh, but number two, this conversation was so special that I had with the ambassador uh, for many, many different reasons. One, she's had an amazing career, but two, she has taken her, her home country of Macedonia and put it on the map when it wasn't on the map yet. And her story is, I think, quite moving in the book. And I'm sure um, many folks from UMD, I, I hope you read the book so you, just so you can read this story of, of what her insights have been into diplomacy and how she got the country on the map. Uh, but when I was meeting with her, uh, what I found is one, she's very animated and everything is purple. She loves wearing purple. But two, uh, that she looks at women at the table in a very different way uh, and her, her role as a woman being the first ambassador, even from her country, in a very different way. She didn't really have an opportunity to, to uh, I would say, to really care whether she was the first woman or the first ambassador. She had work she had to do. If she didn't speak, Macedonia didn't speak. And if she didn't go to an event, Macedonia wouldn't be there. And so her role really changed completely from being a first. So not only was she the first ambassador, but she was the first woman ambassador. And many meetings when she would bring uh, either uh, a colleague with her, or it could be even a translator, it depends. Oftentimes those were men. And when she went to the meeting, the people around the table thought that those men were the ambassador, not her. And she'd have to say, no, I'm, I'm the ambassador. And there's even this, this small story in the book when she was at the White House for an affair to meet with the president and the first lady. She happened to be standing in line and she wasn't married at the time. She came to the event by herself to the White House. And another male ambassador was behind her who happened to also come single and not with a spouse. And when she got up to take the obligatory photograph and the step and repeat, uh, they said, okay, ambassador in the first and your wife, you know, please come take this photo together. And they both looked at each other and they looked at the, the photographer and they said, no, we're, we're both ambassadors representing different countries. And so even that, that small level of not being accepted, but still having to push. And, and that's just a small piece of what she went through. More so dealing with the geopolitical situations of the country and the region at that time, and trying to get significant investment into the country so they would be financially stable, she faced all these other factors while also being faced with discrimination solely on the account of her gender. And so her story I find to be timely and also to know that women actually are still facing things that she mentioned, which I find uh, absolutely awful right that women are still facing the things that she was facing in the early 90s uh, but something she said to me that that has really stuck with me and I, I keep going back to is that she mentioned this idea of not being fearful and that you have to almost create your own success and every time you get beaten down every time you get a no or there's a negative comment or there's something in the news that's awful, you almost, I would say, have to laugh it off. But she said to me that you still have to go forward. You still have to try to achieve the things and not listen to the naysayers. And her strength uh, and in her story, and she, I read about it a little bit more eloquently than I'm saying it right now, but she really believes that. And I think that's why her career was propelled. And I think that's why she was able to become the first ambassador. Her government believed in her as well. So it's something, a lesson for us all to learn. But it was a pleasure interviewing her and I'm still very, very grateful for Meto for setting that up. Amazing, and I think Meto actually just put the uh, link to purchase uh, the book in the Zoom group chat, maybe on Facebook as well. I don't see it yet, or I don't see it right now. Um, but um, perfect, I mean, um, I guess continuing along the, the theme of you know Macedonia, um, what are your thoughts on Macedonians in DC? How, like in, in general? 
well, I've always had a good time with my Macedonian <laughs> friends in DC, let's be real, somewhere on this call right now. Uh, but what I find of Macedonians and the country, a very warm people with a deep, deep history in the region and uh, culturally have so much to give, not only to the region, but to the world. And really through UMD, I've been able to discover a country and a people that I really didn't know much about before. And so I feel very grateful to have this connection in Washington, D.C. and around the world. And I've been to a few different uh, UMD galas and events that uh, it's so joyful. And that's what I find so lovely is that both men and women are joyful and have so much spirit of their country. And I, I think the last gal that we had in person was uh, early spring, late winter. And we were dancing around in a circle. There was drumming and music and everyone was holding hands, which I know we can't do because of COVID. But uh, it was such a warm and festive spirit. And that's also backed up by Macedonians who are smart, capable and changing the world in multiple ways. And what I found to be fascinating at one of these galas is that uh, Meto and the team, uh, the folks that you honored, are leaders in their own field and really striving to make the world a better place. And I think that goes back to the country and the people of it. And uh, I hope many people get to visit Macedonia and, and see what amazing country it is. And especially through UMD, it's been such a pleasure getting to know about the culture and the people in Washington. Thank you, Susan. Um, and I, so I actually had a couple more questions, but um, let's see. So I think we're running a little bit short on time. So I'm just gonna uh, ask my last two questions and then we can turn it over to the audience. Um, so I remember running into you um, at an event in Washington, DC a few months after the ACBH gala. Um, I believe it was the Blue Star Strategies event. Um, and you were kind of in the middle of your creative process for your book and you had so many fantastic ideas running through your mind. Um, I wanted to ask, did you ever experience imposter syndrome during the entire writing process? And um, what effect do you think this has on women specifically in the field of diplomacy? Women question themselves, whether they're in diplomacy or any, uh, in any sector. And when I was writing this book in the creative process, uh, yes, there's times that I question myself completely. One, who am I to write a book about women in diplomacy? And I'm not a diplomat, I'm not a foreign service officer. Two, are these women leaders going to even sit and talk with me? Who's going to be my interviewees for the book? And at that event, and I'm so glad you mentioned the Blue Star Strategies event, uh, because at that event, I, I saw Meto, and he gave me multiple ideas of women leaders to reach out to. And at that event, I began being confident about speaking about the book. And my publisher and my editor said, Susan, you got to start speaking about this book publicly because people are going to offer their help and introduce you to women to interview. And so while I hadn't written a 20, one, one chapter even, uh, here I was asking people, oh, I'm writing this book about women in diplomacy. Do you know of anyone who might be interesting to interview? And actually at that event, uh, I got three different interviews from it. In addition to that, one of those interviews snowballed into six different interviews as they introduced me to different women. So when I think when women have this idea of imposter syndrome, and that maybe they're not at the top level of their field yet or the top level of their game. And men can have this too. I, I don't think it's a, it doesn't have to be gendered. Uh, but what I found is that when you do believe in yourself and you, you, it's not being a charlatan, it's not saying, oh, I, well, I've written all these New York Times bestsellers. No, I haven't. I'm a first time author. I'm hoping to get this message out to the world. But when something is bigger than you, when something's important to you, it's easier to sell that. And people want to help you. I generally find, whether it's in, in diplomacy or any sector, generally people want to help you. And you have to be willing to open up about whatever topic you need help with and then listen. I find that that was super helpful. And then you got to have the drive to go get them. 
and follow up, follow up, follow up. And so that event actually changed uh, the trajectory of the book because it really snowballed into multiple interviews. And, and Metro was a part of that experience, so it was great. That's awesome. Um, okay, well, I mean, I, along those lines, how would you like to see this book used in the future? Um, you, you mentioned that you, you have this um, message that you want to get out to the world, all this information. How do you think that this could shape a better understanding of women in diplomacy for women, um, but also for men? Both men and women need to read the book, uh, not just because I'm selling the book, but more so this idea of gender parity, equality, and equity. If we don't understand these stories and we don't understand the data and research, then how are we supposed to change the systems that we work in? And I really hope that this book, and as Meto said in the beginning of the conversation that he wrote this Amazon review, that it should be required reading and for the State Department and foreign ministries around the world, I believe that if even one individual from any organization reads this book and changes the way they view who's around the table and who they bring around the table, then we will see shifts within our society. I hope young men and women who are interested in diplomacy or the foreign service or international affairs read it when they're in undergraduate uh, studies. I hope that professors maybe make it required reading. I hope that foreign ministries in the State Department give it to uh, entering diplomats. I hope that execs who are on the C-suite who want to change the lens of gender and diversity within their leadership and within their organizations read this book. And I, maybe a little later, I'll, if I have time to tell you about a story from Australia, uh, but the systemic changes that Australia has made within their ministry can be related in the for-profit sector. And I describe these changes in the book, and this is actually the first time that the government and ministry has allowed their plan of women in leadership to be shared publicly. And so if people read this book, we can create step-by-step -step systemic change, but it takes one person at a time. So I hope people read the book because we all have a part to play in bringing gender equality and gender parity around the table. Thank you. Um, and I have one last one, I promise. Um, if there was one thing that you would want readers to take away from reading A Seat at the Table, uh, what would it be? One thing for readers to take from the book. That change starts with one person. That each of these women that had different stories and span the globe from different cultures and countries, uh, change really started with one voice and one person and to keep speaking up. And so if we want to change, especially in the United States right now, we are facing two pandemics of COVID-19 and uh, racial inequality and change starts with one person at a time. And so I hope that people pick up this book and start creating a change one person at a time. And I hope that's what they take away from it. Thank you so much for that. Um, I guess we will move into the Q&A portion um, of this virtual hour. Um, we have Virginia Evans, founder of the Macedonian Film Festival from Toronto, uh, who asks, what is the difference when there's a predominance of women in an organization which is not a woman's organization? Well, Virginia, thank you for the question. There are, I'll give an example. There are many women who work in the nonprofit field. And so while it may not be a woman's organization, there happen to be many, many women working in the field of nonprofit, whether it be diplomacy or another organization. Uh, and what I found though, is that you can look at the composition of an organization and say, okay, what's the split between men and women? And that's one way to look at it. But another way to look at it is that for the split of men and women, the top leadership of the organization, who's around that table? And so I found that uh, speaking with colleagues in the nonprofit field, while women dominated this field and they weren't women's organizations, 
the top leadership and many of the CEOs of these nonprofits happen to be men, predominantly men. And most people in the C-suite of the nonprofits are men. And so when we look at diversity of who's around the table, it starts, yes, from the top with leadership. And then going to the managerial roles, supervisor roles, what's the split between men and women? And we have to look at that. And so uh, when I mentioned Australia, when they got an outside consultant to come into their ministry to determine why there weren't more women in top leadership, as well as managerial roles, they found out that statistically speaking, there needs to be a split of 40% men, 40% women, and 20% either to create significant culture change. So looking at a, a board of an organization, the top leadership, and while there may be many women working in an organization, who is around that leadership table completely matters because those people are creating the policies that are going to affect an organization. Policies such as parental leave, childcare, uh, flex time, and all of those factors affect women and men, but definitely affect women. And so we need to start looking at leadership and asking and requiring that we do a different split of who's at the table. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Virginia, for the question. Um, next question we have here is from UMD Advisory Council member, um, Elizabeth Nomovsky from Toronto. Um, Elizabeth is actually the host of the TV show, Finance is Personal. Um, and she asks, um, women have been hurt the most financially with the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you believe women will be affected regarding getting seats at the table going forward? Elizabeth, I hear you. Yes. Uh, uh, looking at gender from a lens of who's been affected by COVID-19, especially financially, yes, it's been women. Uh, women in their households are still having to sometimes work full-time and do childcare uh, and not go insane at the same time. So financially speaking, women being out of the workforce for different reasons or being laid off, um, we are seeing women being hit um, as some of the hardest with the pandemic. And to have seats at the table to really change this idea of the solutions that we are going to put into organizations and into companies and that financially will affect women, who is coming up with the solutions? Who's sitting at the table? It has to be both men and women. And an article I read uh, a few days ago from NPR speaking about who's on the health task force combating COVID here in the United States, there are very few women. We do not have, even in our own country, in the United States, both men and women are on that table. Now, I can't speak to the health task force in Canada right now. You probably would know that better than I would, Elizabeth. Uh, but looking at the countries that have eradicated or combated COVID-19 at a very high level happen to be countries that are run by women. So if we look at Taiwan, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, New Zealand, all these countries, Germany, have lower death rates and lower cases of coronavirus. In addition to that, economically, their countries are able to open up smarter and quicker than countries that don't have this gender diversity at the table. So if we're going to look at solutions of how women are impacted financially of COVID-19, we need both men and women coming up with those solutions. And it can't just be men saying, okay, we see that women are impacted by this, but uh, there's nothing really we can do about it. No, we, we need both men and women at the table asking certain questions and looking at different ways to combat it. Thank you for the question, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Elizabeth. Um, next question um, is from Sydney, Australia. Um, our UMD board member, Vera Sekulovska, asks, um, in corporate, how do women push through from being placed in listener roles only, but not roles that actually make a difference to the organization? That starts with leadership. And that's something I learned from uh, the Australian ambassador, Katrina Cooper, who's currently the deputy chief of mission in Washington, DC. Uh, she was also a former ambassador from Australia posted in Mexico. Uh, when she got to a senior leadership role as a senior legal advisor for the ministry, 
she saw that many women weren't in the leadership uh, realm of the ministry. In addition to that, she saw that many women weren't in supervisor or managerial roles. And when she was speaking with different colleagues about how to get more women, not just in listening roles, but actually creating policies and enacting policies, it starts with the leadership and it's getting the leader on board first. So she had to go to the secretary of the ministry to get the secretary on board. And while he, he listened to this idea of, yes, yeah, so we, we need more gender parity and I get that. Well, great, um, why don't you head that up, Cooper? And she thought, no, 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 it has to come from you. It has to come from the leadership and it has to be top down. And so there's this idea that if we want women in an organization to actually make a difference, first we gotta go to the leadership and then we gotta change systemically how an organization is run. In addition to that, both men and women need to see women as leaders, as mentors, as trailblazers, and as uh, speakers, not just listeners. And a way you can do that, uh, and this may seem very, very simple, but a way you can do that is also looking how an organization is physically set up. And so in Australia, what, one thing that they did in, by introducing, they introduced flex time and, and flexibility for women to have different times to come into the, to the ministry and to work. But more than that, they looked at the ministry itself and they realized that at the ministry, all the conference rooms were named after either men or flowers. Now, if you imagine your woman coming into a field and you see that no conference room is named by a woman, it's not a very welcoming place. I challenge all of you to think about many conference rooms you've been in, who have they been named after? So what they did is they renamed the conference rooms. They did a split between men and women. They also put their bio in a photo outside the conference room to explain why that person was being honored and why that conference room was named after the person. And so that changed also the perception of people going into a room. Another thing they did is they looked at the artwork and photography in the building itself of the organization. And what they realized is that there were far more photos of men framed along the walls. And I can speak to this in many different organizations that I've been in and I've walked the halls of there are white men photos staring back at me of all the presidents of an organization and all the CEOs of the organization. And so simply seeing that, women can't even see themselves of where they want to go. And I heard this from many women leaders that I interviewed, that you have to be able to see yourself in the position. You have to be able to idea of a goal of where to go to. And so what they did at the ministry is they actually changed the exhibits and changed the art and the photography. And they had both historically accurate representations of men in diplomacy, and they also had contemporary photos of women in diplomacy and women in leadership. And so seeing how women are not just listeners, but actually trailblazers in a field and seeing yourself there allows more women to have goals to reach to. And so each of us can do that in our own organization. How are we welcoming both men and women into a room and into conference rooms, hallways, and multiple places of power? Are we allowing them actually to see themselves there at the table together? Thank you. Um, and one more question from Virginia Evans. Um, did you find that women are helpful to each other, not just with your experience, but also, did you find that your, your interviewees had help or hindrances in achieving their goals? Mm. This was something that many of the women actually, Virginia, I'm so glad you asked this because this is something that women uh, in the book, uh, they spoke about to me and that, uh, Sometimes early in their careers, I'd say the more seasoned diplomats that I interviewed mentioned this idea of women having sharp elbows, that at the certain times in their career, there was only enough room to have one woman at the table. And if they didn't get in there, then another woman would be put in there. So now the experience is quite different. The women that are currently in diplomacy and that are in early in their career, they're finding that pulling women up with them makes it quite stronger. And something that I've heard from many of the ambassadors that I interviewed in Washington, DC, they said that there's this power of three. When you have at least three women at the table, they echo each other. When a woman says something 
and no one says anything else, sometimes the idea can go swept under the rug and a few minutes later, a man will say the same idea and they'll say, great idea, Fred, that's a great idea, when really another woman said it before. And so what women are doing now is saying, oh, great idea, Jessica, repeat that again, I want everyone to hear it, or I need to hear that again, can you explain that more? And so there's a power of the echo. Both men and women can do it. So if you have a woman colleague, let's say you're a man on this call right now, if you have a woman colleague and she said a great idea, echo her. Say, oh, great idea, would you repeat that again or explain that more, I like that. Uh, and that's something that people can do. But now both, all women, I think, have an obligation to help out their sisters, to help out other women. And you're not competing for the one spot at the table because to reach gender parity, there has to be an equal amount of spots. And so now women are, are definitely helping each other far more than before, and it's more so seen like a sisterhood versus back in the day, it was a competition. And so it definitely has changed. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Virginia, again, for, for your other question. Now, I, I have one final question. Um, what advice would you give to women in non-Western countries on leadership? Advice to give women in non-Western company. Well, you know what? This is actually, I think, a global issue, uh, Meto. And uh, the advice I'd give, and I, I see it in the chat box too from Belinda speaking about how women are their, their own worst critics. Uh, we need to get out of our own way. And women uh, globally face this, that we are our worst critics. We have a mantra in our head that plays over and over again that we listen to. I do it myself. Uh, and we will be the worst person to beat ourselves up. And so I have found through speaking with both men and women that women inherently do it more. And this may be very sexist for me to say, but I believe women do. We are hard on ourselves. And when I spoke with the Finnish ambassador, she told me, look, women constantly want to be 100%. We want to be 100% in our career, 100% in our personal lives, and 100% perfect. However, no one's perfect. And this idea in society, and especially in non-Western countries, you cannot reach perfection, not as a woman and not as a man. And so when you eliminate that perfection factor, and realize that imperfection, that was what makes you unique. You can really grow in your leadership. And so in, for women in non-Western non -Western countries, uh, being unique should be seen as a powerful tool, not as a hindrance. And the more women and men that do that, they will be able to reach their own leadership potential. And so I believe that not being 100%, not being perfect, and trust me, I am not perfect at all, nor do I ever hope to be, because it is far more interesting to have imperfections, and you learn from your failures, and we all need to do that. And that will bring more seats to the table of having the diversity of thought, because your failures, things that don't go right, you are able to create better solutions because you already know what doesn't work. Thank you. And, and thank you so much, everybody, for, you know, submitting your questions. Um, thank you, Susan, for joining us. I, I wanted to ask, do you have any final thoughts for the audience um, before we end off here? I will say that it's been a pleasure speaking with you all tonight. And thank you both Christina and Meto for having me. Uh, I believe that diversity and having both genders at the table is not only important, but imperative for our world. And organizations like UMD bring different voices to the table that have to be heard. And diplomacy and multilateral solutions are only going to happen if we have diversity around the table, especially from different countries around the world. And so the more different people that we get together through different lenses, the better our world's going to be. And I hope each of you uh, will get a chance to read my book. I'm gonna throw up a, a slide on the screen so you know how to get in touch with me. So bear with me, I'm just going to share my screen. But it's been a pleasure speaking with all of you tonight. And I hope that we can continue this conversation offline so you can find me 
uh, at SusanSloan.com. The book is uh, all available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Right now I'm recording the audio book, which will, will be released in the fall. And follow me on Twitter at Real Susan Sloan. And I hope you get a chance to check out UMD's awesome events because UMD throws together wonderful programs and I attend them myself when I can. So thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, this was such an engaging conversation. Um, we at UMD and its Young Leaders Program, Generation M, are making sure that women have a seat at the table. Um, and believe it or not, more than 60% of our leadership um, is women. Um, and we pride, our, yeah, we pride ourselves on encouraging even more uh, to get involved because of their role as community leaders, mothers, daughters, sisters, doma kinki. Um, but business leaders, public, serv pu public servants, lawyers, doctors, and more. Um, we have an important role to play uh, in the Macedonian community, um, but also at the local, state, province, national, and international level. Um, we need to continue the conversation on women being seen as leaders, and your book, Susan, really elevates the conversation to a whole new level. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, thank you to all of our participants and those watching live on Facebook. Uh, before we conclude, we have several more virtual conversations next month on maintaining your Macedonian language skills, financials for millennials, um, imposter syndrome, as well as leadership development. Um, stay tuned uh, to our social media for announcements coming soon. Um, and once again, thank you so much, Susan, and to all who took the time out of their schedule to learn more about women, diplomacy, and lessons from women. Um, make sure you all get a copy of A Seat at the Table and have a good night uh, and day to our Australian audience. 